Howdy, folks. This is Michael with the CCERP podcast, Cypress Creek Ecological Restoration Project. So today, we're talking more about the E for Ecology. We'll be talking a little bit about ecology, species, environments, interactions, invasive species, pros and cons, influences, and to join us in this discussion is a multi-time guest, Terry MacArthur. Terry, could you say hi, please? Hi, everybody. And people can look up in prior podcasts Terry's bio and accomplishments and multifaceted mastery of many different areas of human accomplishment. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, let's do that. Okay, be in awe. So, be in awe. Um, invasive species. Yeah. What the hell is an invasive species? Invasive, or like they taking it over? It's like war or something? Are they it's invading exactly us? exactly like that. Yes, it's exactly like that. What's an so invasive... There are there are federal definitions of invasive species. And in a nutshell, to be an invasive species, according to those federal guidelines, it has to be non-native to the area where it exists. And it has to either cause or have the potential to cause harm economically, human health-wise, uh, environment-wise. Um, you know, those sorts of criteria. So uh, there are many, many species, both plant and animal, that the feds uh, prohibit from being possessed, bought, sold, transported, introduced into water, uh, waterways, and so forth, so on. To keep it more simple... For most of us, it is it is non-native species that are out of in the wrong place, out of their natural environment, with few, if any, natural controls, so that they proliferate at a rate that does do that harm to the environment, and that's you know pretty much how we think of it when we get out there to monitor what's, what's especially plants growing in our natural ecosystem and how we deal with them, how we view them, what, what our uh, goals are in uh, reducing or eliminating them, all come back to the fact that they're, they're not natives here and they do damage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... So, so really, yeah. So, yeah, so... It's important to see that it's a contextual ecological thing. We can't just look at something out of context. Um, And some species can be non-native, but acceptable. I don't remember. I forgot. Is there a term for that? Or are they just called non-native? I think we got native. Yeah, they're just typically called non-native. Yeah. Yeah. So there's some that are non-native and what's the word? Innocuous. They're fine. Um, yeah, sure, sure. But some, yeah, that are non-native and invasive, and I'll put some definitions up so people can see from, like, U.S. Forest mm-hmm. Service, mm-hmm. National Geographic, um, people can see if they want, get some information. Because yeah. um, in so, some, like, um, the Chinese elm, it's non-native, but it was needed because of the elm disease um, that hit, what was that, in the 50s when there was, there used to be a lot of elm trees, was it yep. on yep. lining city streets, but there was a yep. Dutch elm disease that um, came over and killed off a lot of them. So, And the same sort of thing has happened with other species that were attacked by non-native uh, pests of some kind or other, 
Um, there are non-natives that actually become well adapted to an area and can even be beneficial. I mean, a couple of them that come off the top of my head are things like earthworms and honeybees that are non-native to the United States, but yet are considered healthful organisms in, in many ecosystems. Yeah, there right. can also be natives, especially vegetation, that can be very aggressive in its growth, but it never makes the invasive list because it's a native species. Mm -hmm. yeah, a couple earth. of examples off the top of my head <clears throat> of that would be things like yopon holly. People love to hate yopon holly because it grows so proliferatively, but it's it's a native, so it's it's just called aggressive. And things like uh, our native river cane, um, very aggressive grower, but mm -hmm. it's a native, so it's not ever going to be termed invasive. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then, yeah, the ecosystem matters, the context, because um, some places need leaf cover on the ground, and earthworms can get rid of that. Earthworms can, pull, you know, cut up, eat the leaves, pull them into the ground, um, mess with the soil, aerate it, all that. And so in some situations, there haven't been earthworms. And bringing earthworms to those places changes the nature of the forest. So, so let's talk for just a minute about ecosystems and, and the benefits we get from ecosystems as, as an intro to the differences when invasives move in. So humans rely on ecosystems for many, many services. I mean, let's talk about the most obvious one that every school kid knows about, photosynthesis. So think about those interactions in that ecosystem that lead us to benefit from photosynthesis. First, uh, a seed has to have interactions with soil microbes to get nutrients to grow into a tree. The tree has to have interactions with the atmosphere, with sunlight, with moisture, either in the soil or in the atmosphere. Um, it has to have chlorophyll so that those interactions then become a process that we call photosynthesis. Um, nobody has thought to ask the trees what they call it, so we don't know that answer, but we call it photosynthesis. And the big bonus as far as those interactions go, is they function to provide us the service of releasing all the excess oxygen from that process into the atmosphere for humans and every other living thing to use. So it's not, you can't look at photosynthesis helps put oxygen into the atmosphere by itself. And yeah, there are so, a zillion interactions that have to happen first. And it's, it's important to think about where those trees and green plants, but let's kind of isolate to trees, where those trees are, what their ecosystems look like. It's not the same trees everywhere all over the world. It, trees can be very selective where they grow. And soils can be very selective what they allow to grow. So it still comes down to interaction. And for us to benefit from those services, it has taken not just millennia, but eons for those relationships to develop. And for us to have the benefits of those relationships, because not everybody plays well together, native or not. They don't all play well together. So, you know, for example, you mentioned those uh, soil organisms, especially the microbes that decompose uh, uh, all the organic stuff that ends up dead on the ground, the leaves, the branches, all of that material. In point of fact, when it comes to the invertebrates who are a big part of that de decomposing community, 
Uh, in essence, all plants are toxic to insects. So for insects to have a relationship with plants, even the insects and other invertebrates that help with decomposition, there has to be that eons of co-evolution for them to get along together. I'd like to talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but um, it still is about interaction. We have to have all those ecosystem interactions to end up with the functions that we call environmental services, the kinds of good things we get. So when it comes to, let's go back to photosynthesis. So, I mean, what a what a huge and critical part of the services that we get, as well as other or oxygen-using organisms, from that one process, but more green in an environment doesn't necessarily mean a good thing mm -hmm. because of that um, eons-long um, co-evolvement that put us in a place where those plants were in that place doing that task for us. Uh, it, they weren't there during the time when those plants, those microbes, those organisms were um, developing the, the kinds of interactions that lead us to those benefits. So what happens is um, something that's not native moves into the neighborhood. Well, you know, a few non-natives, as you pointed out, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, doom and gloom, but if they turn out to be invasive, that's where the problems come in. And and so, uh, unless you have a particular question at this point, I mean, what natives do is change the ecosystem. All plants essentially are toxic to insects. So let's think about that. Um, you know, there's monarch butterflies have been in the news. It's uh, they're buzzwords right now. Everyone is concerned about the decline in monarchs. But let's think about the plant they rely on as a host plant to lay eggs and for food sources for the larval stages. Milkweed is toxic to insects. If insects try to eat milkweed, the first thing that happens is all that thick, milky, sticky substance that exudes when you damage or break a stem or a leaf is one of the world's best glues. It instantly glues all the mouse parts of that insect closed, and they die from starvation because they can no longer take in food. So monarch butterflies are no different from other insects in that regard. If they try to eat milkweed and they get that sticky stuff on their mouth parts, their mouths are glued shut and they would die. But they, over the eons, developed other ways of adapting so they can use milkweed. When you watch a female monarch laying her eggs, she typically lays the eggs on the bottom side of the leaf on a milkweed plant. When that larva emerges from the egg, the first thing it does is eat the egg remnants because that's full of nutrition to give them a kick start of energy to get to get growing. And after they've eaten the remnants of the egg, they slowly crawl down the bottom of the leaf, more or less along that um, center vein, the mid rib of the leaf, to the point where the leaf attaches to the petiole, that little short stem that the leaf attaches to that runs off the main stem. And on the bottom, where that central vein is, on, uh, on the bottom, the monarch chews through that vein, but not through the leaf, just through that vein, which effectively cuts off any chance of that milky substance flowing from the stem into the leaf. So they didn't learn to eat that sticky stuff. They didn't learn to, to avoid getting their mouths glued shut. What they learned was how to stop that from happening. 
Just so when you see a milkweed plant and some of the leaves are hanging down as though they're wilted, it's usually because that midrib has been cut through on the bottom and the leaf is hanging down as a result. You can almost guarantee that there are some monarch or other milkweed butterfly larvae on that plant that are busy now. They crawl back down to the tip of the leaf and begin eating lunch because they've cut off that dangerous flow of that sticky stuff. And so we got to be so, careful about pulling leaves off just because it's some habit. Oh, look, this leaf's dead. Pull it off. Like that. If it's a milkweed plant, you want all parts left intact for the, for the monarch larva to be able to use it to the extent possible. But here's what happens. Things change in ecosystems. Invasives move in and they begin affecting the decomposing community because those fungi, bacteria, invertebrates have no relationship with the new plant. So when it begins dropping its leaves, that decomposing community is very likely not to be able to decompose and release those nutrients, or if they can, the nutrients themselves may not be in the form that uh, other native plants would put into the soil. So um, things begin to go badly uh, as the decomposing community dwindles because now these, these new plants have no relationship with them and some of them fall out. Uh, the, you know, the native plants that are there may be getting fewer nutrients as a result. The native plants arrive with few to no natural controls. None of the insects or diseases that help keep them in check are here. So the plant can proliferate, outcompete, overgrow, choke out, and it in, a, in essence uh, displace the natives. So the entire ecosystem is beginning to suffer from the changes in how all those interactions that made it a healthy ecosystem before are now negatively affected. So... If milkweed happens to be one of the plants that gets displaced by overgrowth of non-native invasives, well, when the female monarch is reaching the end of her life during migration, and as you know, it takes several generations from the time they leave the north till they arrive in Mexico, mm -hmm. when one generation of that female monarch is trying to find a place to lay eggs, She's near death. She's near the end of her life. She's got to find a place to lay those eggs. She's going to try to find the milkweed that's on the flyway that, sh that every generation of monarchs have used for those millennia. And if it's not there, she probably will lay the eggs on some other plant. But in essence, all plants are toxic to insects. So when those eggs, when those larvae emerge from those eggs, they know how to deal with milkweed, but not with other plants. So when they try to eat some other plant, whatever its toxic scheme is, is going to kill the larva. And so there's a whole generation of monarch butterflies that will never continue on to Mexico. And... It's, it's one of many different things that's driving the decline in monarchs and many other pollinators is the changes that are taking place in ecosystems. And in large part, most of the time, it's because there are non-native invasive species present that completely change up the ecosystem. And, and things like butterflies, pollinators are not the only thing. Insects are very important in ecosystems. Insects feed higher life forms. Insects, the beneficial ones, help keep the ones you don't want, the ones that are pests, under control. Insects help with pollination in their own way. But thinking about feeding things like birds um, during the summer months when especially songbirds are breeding, 
they have to greatly increase their intake of insects as a protein source to keep them healthy enough for good breeding. Then comes fall into winter, and not only the uh, resident birds in an area, but especially those that migrate now need a whole nother kind of food. No more are they eating those high-protein insects. Now what they need is high-fat vegetation, berries especially, uh, that grow on native plants that are in their flyway, that for generations, millennia, eons, the birds have flown the same flyway. It doesn't matter where the bird populations are in the United States. They tend to fly east from the west coast and west from the east coast to that central major flyway that puts them out over across the Gulf of Mexico heading to the south. And if our native uh, high-fat content plants have been displaced by more tropical uh, fruit and berry-producing plants, They, instead of getting high fat from things like beauty berry and yopon holly and hackberry and uh, a a zillion other natives that the birds have learned to look for, now what they get are the non-native vines that have high sugar content berries. And one thing... And it's not that they... It's not... I'm sorry? Really quickly... um, before we go on to the more about the berries and that, I just want to point out that because here some people might be thinking, but we feed them, we put out bird feeders, and we get them like bread and food like that, but it's not the nutrients in the right balance that they need all the time. We'd have to know what the needs of the bird are. If we're giving out exactly. some cute little bird seed that's made from whatever we don't know because we don't look at it and we don't have a biological or ecological understanding of the birds. You know, it's nice people do that. Thank you. Help the birds. But if it's not appropriate, then they don't have the calcium and materials they need to make eggs. Just like, I think as we talked before, some people like to feed bread to ducks, but that is unhealthy and that will end the lives and the, um, the reproduction of some ducks because with they'll fill up on bread it's not the nutrients they need they don't have the calcium or protein to produce healthy viable eggs um reproduction ends um it's not yeah. helping the ducks it's just like some kind of um population control program you know people don't intend <laughs> that of course We don't know better because we're not taught biology and ecology properly. This stuff is more important. We can experiment. We can see it. We need more stuff like this in the schools and less, um, oh, let's learn about DNA. You know, how much is all this time spent about memorizing DNA and putting little C's and G's together or whatever, helping people understand something like this? It really matters. No. Um, Yes, DNA is important for certain people, but... For most people, they need to learn something like this first. But since some people could be thinking about the um, bird seed thing and feeding the birds and certain given bread or whatever, I just wanted to bring that in there that um, it's nice. It's appreciated. That can be just like um, a piece of cake is good for us. Sometimes it's good for giving us some carbs or whatever if it's like, not got a bunch of too much junk in it if it's like kind of healthy cake so to speak but if the birds rely too much on that then um reproduction ends it's more destructive to the species than helpful so we got to be careful about that um and we need these things as you say yeah in summertime if you want to feed birds try to feed um higher quality things like um Oh, black oil sunflower seeds or even thistle seed for to help songbirds um, and put mealworms out. 
I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you can yeah. buy mealworms if you don't want to grow them. Just have to put mealworms out because they need insects. Then in winter, put suet out. They need fat. Here, here's what here's the thing. So, migrating birds they head south. They get down here into this area. If they can't find the high fat berries they need to build up their strength and reserves to fatten themselves up, they have a days and days flight across the Gulf of Mexico before they hit land again. They will not be able to stop to eat, to drink, or to rest. They have to be fattened up, filled up with enough fat to keep their bodies warm and to survive those days-long flights. So if they can only find high sugar tropical type berries and not find the berries they need, they'll, they'll eat them because they're going to be hungry and they'll try to eat as much as they can to fatten themselves up. But that sugar high runs out. And every year, you know, there are people out there monitoring how many birds end up dead on the beach somewhere because they didn't have enough energy to complete that flight and arrive at that far shore. So if you if you really want to help birds, especially the migrants in the winter, you know, plant things like Yopon holly and beautyberry and um, even things like black hog viburnum, um, I don't know, coral honeysuckle, um, things that really have those higher fat berries and fruits in the in the winter time and and for resident birds the same thing is true think about you know the size of a lot of our resident birds a dozen paper clips weigh as much as some of those small birds think how much shivering something like a titmouse has to do overnight during a cool night to keep itself warm enough to live through the night till morning when the sun comes up and it can go get something to eat to warm back up. Think about that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if, if you, if you want to think about the problem of invasive species in a way that relates to things we know and love, think about insects, The, the insects we want, Think about birds, the birds we want. Think about all the other wildlife that relies on food that they have developed relationships with so they can use them. And what happens in ecosystems when they get disrupted by the intrusion of invasive species? It's not a small problem. It's not a simple problem. It's not one to be taken lightly. It's an important problem. So maintaining native species in our ecosystems is, it's not just something that would be nice to do. If if we want our ecosystems to keep functioning in ways that we can still benefit from, even though we don't put a dollar value on it, even though we don't really give it its due, keep natives in their place, help promote them, preserve them, replace them, restore them, and help get rid of invasive species. Do what you can. Yeah. Remember, philosophically, in terms of the nature of things, we are a part of nature. We're not separate from it. Um, Unfortunately, in some aspects of our culture and some places on Earth, People want to think they're above, beyond, separate from, better than nature, but that's um, not true. Um, Something of a delusion. Um, We're part of nature. If we want to live well on this earth and be good human animals, we need a good ecosystem. Um, We don't carry our health around with us regardless of circumstances. As we can see, when people go into space, they don't have the ecosystem, the ecology, the habitat they need to survive and thrive. Um, They're missing a lot of atmosphere, hence they get 
more bombarded by cosmic rays affecting their vision, their DNA. They don't have gravity, so there's muscle and bone degeneration. Um, there's things we don't even think about and that we wouldn't know to really consider if it weren't for space travel and some things like that. But we look at what's, what happens there versus what life is like on Earth. And we see what we need and how vital it is to our survival. We can't just take our yeah. health with us willy-nilly into space. Oh, I'm super strong. I have good bone density. No, we only have bone density in relationship to the Earth. It's a constant, dynamic, evolving, long-term thing. It's not some characteristic that we take with us for all time. It's like people had to learn some things like that, even in physics. It used to be thought that weight was an attribute of us, but learning about gravity and the force of gravity and getting the universal gravitation equation that Newton did, he learned that weight is a relationship. Mass is something we take with us, but our weight will be different because we'd have a different relationship with the Earth versus the Moon versus some other planet. So it's a similar thing. Health is a relationship. It's a consequence of a relationship. It isn't something we do and have regardless. Or like people would think, man, this lion is so big and strong. And then it's so vital and beautiful and graceful and athletic and agile. And they put it in this little cage and the health degenerates. Well, of course, because health is a relationship to a species appropriate environment it's not something you can cage up or bring around wherever and the same thing with a lot of animals ecology is important for us it's not something that's irrelevant and that's why some zoos have thankfully have found that out and they're they've radically changed how they do things instead of stupid little concrete cages and bars they realize well we have to put our animal in something appropriate to their ecology. Some apes or gorillas would like throw up a lot because they were fed some kind of human kind of food on a human schedule. But people had to find out that, oh, they should be eating a lot, small meals throughout the day. And so they're doing this throw up, eat their throw up, throw up, eat their throw up thing because they're trying to follow their own nature and make it happen in that kind of way. But then some people thankfully learned, oh, we need to give them food closer to what they're used to. So let's buy some lettuce and things like that. Give them small little bits that they got to forage to to find. They don't just have a bunch of stuff plopped down on a little plate like three times a day as a human might. That's not appropriate to their species. They must be put in an appropriate environment with appropriate forces appropriate timing, appropriate ecology in general, to be healthy and to have psychological well-being. So this discussion about ecosystems and invasives is not some little airy-fairy thing separate from us, um, some cute little movie. It's important to our psychological well-being. And look at modern Western culture in a lot of cases. Um, Psychological health is not too good. Chronic disease is high. Obesity is high. Why? There's different reasons, but one is we need an appropriate ecosystem to be healthy, like it or not. And that ecosystem is not living inside a house or well, changing things in general. Yeah, you know, World Health Organization in their definition of quality of life includes the fact that People's perception of the environment in which they live plays a very large factor <laughs> in how they define their quality of life. And so, you know, it goes back to uh, we don't always consider the interactions within ecosystems that create those functions we need, want, and rely on for life to continue on Earth. So... If, if you stop to think about those, you end up in that place where you realize that um, in any fully functioning ecosystem, all the niches are filled. 
there's there's really not need nor room for something new to come in. But we humans tend to constantly create disturbances in ecosystems by our, quote, management of the land, the world. And when we create those disturbances, then it opens the door for all manner of changes. And not all changes are good for ecosystem function. So when non-natives move in, period, there are ramifications. But when those non-natives are invasive and begin to overtake other things, displace them, choke them out, outcompete them, that's when bad things really begin to happen. And we see, you know, we, we talk about the decline of birds, the decline of pollinators and all as a result of, of loss of habitat. Well, that's exactly what we're talking about, loss of habitat. It's, it's the function of the ecosystem where their habitats are. And it's, it's this thing like the migration. You know, those, those flyways have existed for millennia. And they, the, the animals that migrate learn to expect to find what they need along that pathway. And when they don't, they suffer and they die. And, and we bemoan their decline, but we don't always think about what we could do to help reduce that decline, to help improve that habitat. So, you know, I, I would encourage anyone who, who hears this, uh, give some thought to what you're growing right in your own landscape. Find out what some of the invasives are for your area. And consider, at least, consider removing invasives and replacing them with the natives that are wildlife that we really want and love rely on. It's a good thing to do. It help, And it helps with ecosystem health. It helps keep the soil healthier so that everything else growing in the ecosystem can be healthier because decomposition is happening the way it should. Um, Soil networks of things like fungi are happening the way they should because all the participants have these relationships and interactions that drive those functions. Yeah. Another way to think about the important interaction, about the importance of the interaction thing is think about what happens when we isolate. Um, while we are um, fish and fusion animals, um, when we can't get some of that larger connection that we need is the fusion part during this COVID quarantine stuff going on and all this cultural pain, psychological pain, um, it causes problems. We need relationships. Yeah. Um, sure. And that's just, some animals don't need that social aspect, but as humans we do, but that's like part of our ecology. We need that connection. Um, and we know animals and plants are important and they're important to our psychological well-being you know, look at the fact that we bring in plants indoors. We have pets. We want to be around animals and plants, and we need it. We can't just be healthy in some place where that doesn't happen. There's that whole biophilia idea, hypothesis. Sure. Um, yeah. So that's another aspect to the importance of the connection thing and being part of ecology. Um, well, referencing E.O. Wilson, you mentioned biophilia, you're referencing him. He said that the 21st century is, is destined to be known as the century of the environment. Well, that would be a wonderful thing if it turns out, but we're already 20 years in. And I am not seeing it as the century of the environment yet. Um, I think we've got a long way to go. And I think that it, we can take small steps and work toward that, and a, a step that um, pretty much anyone can take is to look around their own 
domain and see if there are non-native, especially plants, but some other organisms, some animals and pests, are there non-native invasives that could be removed and in their stead increase the number of natives that ecosystems and wildlife climb. You know, start there. Start there. And they can look up, um, like, what is it? Texas A&M has that plant center named after the, one of the president's wives. What was that? Um, Lady Bird Johnson. Thank you. Center. Yeah. And you can look there to get a lot of ideas about natives and look at other places. Um, there's a lot of stuff way beautiful, way more beautiful. Some flowers more beautiful than some of the stuff I see people plant temporarily that gets destroyed by freezes anyway, and that needs too much water. Um, if people would look up that, if there were some resources for that, if it was taught in school, um, it'd be a lot easier and we'd be better off. Um, and then some of the stuff could feed insects and birds and people as well. Get some nice natives you... like dewberry, Pennsylvania blackberry, southern dewberry, Pennsylvania blackberry. Um, get some of the um, dewberry, or no, I should say that. I mean, the, um, here we go around, the, the mulberry trees, um, mulberries, yeah. stuff like that. Um, there'd be lush gardens to look at. Um, nice foliage, nice flowers, and then it'd be, as I say, good for insects, birds, people, yeah. better for the diet. I sent, I sent you a link, Michael, that yeah. I asked if yeah. you could share when you post this that uh, helps people learn about some of the worst local invasive species for our area, both plants and animals. And um, I would encourage folks to, to check that out to learn more about local invasive problems. Yeah, it's an education thing. I used to not know any better at one time. You got to learn, um, learn what it is, what an ecosystem is, what invasives are, why it matters. Um, as we've talked about some, how it's really relevant to us. You know, for one thing, aesthetics. And people love to see butterflies. Um, see them fly, flying around um, it's good for that but then there's more with the butterflies too other than aesthetics it's like if someone wants to practice moving really slow and practice slow controlled movement try to like get an iPhone and stock up on a butterfly and take its picture really close <laughs> <laughs> that is good movement man because so, mm. depending on the species too some of them are more sensitive than others and sometimes it can be easy to get close to one or um, some kind of dragonfly or damselfly, that kind of thing. But sometimes um, some of them, man, it is difficult. So yeah. like, good luck trying. But it's like I've done, I wish I had it on video, but I've done a lot of good fitness training, movement practice, just doing that, taking pictures of butterflies. Sometimes, you know, you got um, – my left foot's down. I've got my right foot crossed, like in front of my left. My knees are touching. It's a foot away. And then I bend down and I put my hands out and you got to wait for the camera to focus sometimes. And I can be in that position for like three minutes trying to take a picture of a butterfly. It's like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> strength. It's like, there's my yoga. I don't need to take it from anybody. I got it yep. right there. Yeah. But yep. that's a good workout. So, yeah, you got the beauty, you got the aesthetics, you got movement practice, you're out in the sunshine, you got the fresh air, um, you can make it a competition with your friends, but there's a lot of things. Um, oh, we're, uh, we're going to do, the Woodlands Township is going to do um, another Invasives workshop on August 14th. I will send you that link on Monday when I'm back in the office. And that's so 2021, by the way, for everybody in the website. future. Yeah. August 14th, yes, 2021. 2021. Yeah. So if it's in the future, yeah. 2022, no. Okay. <laughs> so Probably not going to happen. I'll send you that link on Monday. Cool. Thank you. We can put that yeah. up. But, um, <clears throat> and 
So what are some other invasive species? Um, some of the ones we deal with here in the Woodlands area, uh, north of Houston, some of the worst ones along our pathways and green spaces are air potato vine, nandina, elephant ears, uh, what else, what else? Um, I don't know. There's a whole long list of things that are problematic along our green spaces. And it's because, you know, all that land was once a wonderful forested ecosystem and we disturbed it by putting in streets and houses and, and the pathways themselves. They all created openings for other things to begin to grow. And sure, some natives grow when you open up a place. Some natives come up, but they are disadvantaged compared to the non-natives with those few to no natural control. So those are the things that, that overgrow. Um, we've got a big problem with both Chinese and Japanese privet. Um, of course, I, you know, it's almost pointless to mention Chinese tallow anymore. That is a tree that has gotten such a foothold that I, I don't know if we even can realistically talk about eradicating it. Hmm. If, wow. You know, if you see a small Chinese tallow tree, pull it up. I mean, everyone helps, but uh, it is it is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. um, but so we're battling these things uh, in in neighborhoods and on pathways. We uh, in 2018 we started doing trainings for volunteers, specifically to help residents who wanted to volunteer to help with this. Now there are over a hundred individuals who uh, routinely volunteer to help with removing invasive species along the pathways and in the green spaces in the Woodland Township. Uh, in the okay. year 2020, difficult as it was because of COVID restrictions, that group put in more than a thousand volunteer hours Sweet. on pathways removing invasives. Good. Thank you to them. Yes, thank you to them. And some others are what the zebra mussel is it called? Zebra mussel has has showed up and been eradicated from cool. Lake Travis, so thank Good. goodness for that. But, but it is beginning to show up in other waterways <laughs> that could impact ours. Um, things like apple snails are moving <laughs> into the area. Yeah. Emerald ash borers are killing all varieties of ash tree, native ash trees. Um, and non-native ash trees that may be growing in, in Texas. Um, there, there are just uh, so, so many invasive species to deal with. Um, as I say, if you know, if you'll put that link to the Galveston, galvebayinvasive.org, uh, that group and uh, Houston Advanced Research Center collaborated to um, create that document that was translated at first into a print booklet because of a grant that Park got. Uh, but more recently, even though there are still print copies available, it's been um, more utilized as a digital guide online at that link that I sent you to share. And it, cool. it will tell you if it's a prohibited species that you remember I mentioned earlier at the start that um, both at the state and federal level, there are some uh, invasive species that are prohibited. And hmm. so a lot of them in Texas are waterway plants, but not all. There are, and then... You know, are you are getting plants. further from your... Um, house or something it's like you were coming and fine it seems like you're breaking up a little bit sometimes the sound i don't know quality, i turned just... my head maybe i turned my head the wrong way hmm. <laughs> okay <laughs> that's it did the wind blow your hair and like it could have <laughs> change yeah, the electrical have. signal or something and bones all <laughs> sensitive and yep. electronics <laughs> geez yep. but um could you repeat some of the stuff you just said make sure we get that okay was there something specific you didn't hear? I was 
I was talking about the the um, the guide to invasive species originally mm-hmm. um, Houston Advanced Research Center, which is out here. Uh, they're an environmental research group that's in the woodlands. Uh, they got a grant and worked with Galveston Bay Foundation to create that document, which was printed initially. But and and although print copies are still available, uh, it's much more utilized as a digital guide at that galvbayinvasives.org website that I sent you to share. Okay. And um, that document will even tell you about the the invasives that are prohibited, both at state and federal level. Um, they'll cool. tell you which ones are toxic and whether they're toxic to animals, wildlife, humans, whatever. Um, they'll tell you if they're already in the state of Texas or if there's something we're watching for. That kind of information. So. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and and they're pretty good descriptors and ID guides there too. Cool. Yeah. And then zebra mussel, kudzu, hogs, Chinese tallow, um, some others besides what you mentioned. What's the one? I forgot the name. There's a vine, a Japanese vine that grows um, along trails, open areas. Um, yeah. The most mo- most likely one you'll see is Japanese honeysuckle. Hmm. Okay, and it has those idea. lovely white tube flowers that um, the problem is it overgrows everything. It overgrows trees, shrubs, grass, anything, and um, chokes them out, keeps the sunlight from to- getting to them. Another one is Japanese climbing fern, which is a true fern. I think that's it's it. the only true fern. The only true fern you'll find in vine form here, and it's a non-native invasive, it ladders up trees. It grows up trees and uses them to ladder across and can end up completely overgrowing an area. The Japanese climbing fern is kind of our kudzu, really. Hmm. It um, it will overgrow everything, and, the, and the, not just that it's keeping sunlight from reaching plants so that the plants are less healthy. It's also a hazard because in the winter, it all turns brown, nice, crispy, dead brown, but it persists in the trees. If we ever have wildfire, wildfires hmm. come through in winter, in fall and winter, when that um, dry material is all through, starting from the ground level all the way up, they could become ladders to tear, take those fires up into the tree crown, and fire that's traveling in treetops is almost impossible to control. Hmm. On the ground, you have a chance, but when it's up in the treetops, it's really, really difficult. So it's, it's actually a pretty much of a fire hazard, too. So when you see ferns growing in a vine format in our, in our ecosystems around here, it's very likely to be Japanese climbing fern and needs to get removed. Yeah, and some trees have evolved to be kind of, mm, what's the word I'm trying to think of, but their fire is appropriate for them. They need it. Um, yeah. Branches are up things higher. Like long leaf, yeah, so, things yeah. like longleaf pine, they can't, they really don't grow well until a fire crosses. And then mm-hmm. they begin to grow rapidly and, and mature into bigger trees. They can stay in that little short mop top looking uh, sapling stage for years waiting for a fire to come through. And there are other other trees and plants, other uh, all kinds of grasses that rely on fire to help with their growth and reproduction. But, you know, we humans in our uh, all, ultimate wisdom suppressed <laughs> fire these days so and then yeah like so with some of the trees if the japanese climbing fern is up there and it's all dead some of the trees defenses are bypassed they can't you know the thing they've done to evolve for millennia um it's destroyed and instead of a fire yep. burning through that can help the tree catch on fire um i would think yeah haven't seen yeah. any research, but seems appropriate and plausible to me. 
Um, yeah. Destroying the tree, creating more open areas, and hence destroying, you know, possibly just changing the whole nature of the area in the forest. Yes. Um, and the American Indians is some no, you know, new about ecology and they would start some fires on purpose to clear out some undergrowth to maintain an ecology appropriate to them. Um, I mean, that's a point that's interesting. Elephants change their ecology, beavers, prairie dogs. And so the thing isn't so much don't change it, it's do it right. There's rules, laws, things we need to have an ecology appropriate for us you can't just be willy nilly, do whatever you want. There's things that all animals do. Trees change their environment, and some forests can change how much rain there is in that area. But yep. it's a matter of being biologically appropriate and smart. Um, not just doing whatever ignorantly. Um, yeah, that's why some species are considered keystone species. Mm -hmm. They actually engineer the environment for the betterment of the ecosystem as a whole. Whether mm -hmm. it's in the soil or in the water, you know, or in the vegetation, uh, they they the ecosystem's health relies on their presence, and that's why they're considered keystone. Beavers, you mentioned beavers are one, for example. Well, it's interesting how. It can make a big effect. I think some people have said, I don't remember how much they've proven, but up in the Northeast, the winters are different um, now than they used to be because there used to be more beavers and hence more retained water and hence more material that would absorb heat. Um, so the temperature would be more modulated, but that's that control on thermodynamics is no longer there. So the temperature is not what it would be at that time. Um, used to be a long time ago before all the beavers were unfortunately like wiped out. A lot of them, not all of them, of course. Yeah. But um, yeah, I don't remember some of the details on that. How it affects the winter, the summer. Um, the amount of snow, but the temperature is different by a few degrees, at least, I think, from what it would otherwise be. Yes. Well, a lot of things change. When you take mm -hmm. uh, a long time existing beaver colonies and you remove them, a lot of things change in a, in a, that aquatic ecosystem. A lot of things, and, and not for the good. Yeah. And there's pr proof on that. I'll try to post some links, but um, there's it's proven there's some farmers in some places who think it's like they've been going for generations, killing the beavers, but then their rivers are unhealthy. Then when someone convinces them to try, maybe gives them some evidence and they um, are willing to experiment, they find that when they reintroduce beavers, it makes for healthier streams and they actually have more water through droughts when they would have otherwise struggled. They have more grass and a more variety of vegetation for their animals to eat. Then they got some deer and other animals coming back. Um, so it makes it healthier overall, better for their farm, their profit, um, wildlife, um, having other wildlife and vegetation to eat. There's more they can pick um, when they know about some foraging, stuff that's natural in the area that they can eat, or they could bag a deer or whatever that would be in the area, which would otherwise not be there. Um, so And bringing that back to, in, to the conversation about invasive species here in the South, uh, a lot of beavers are being displaced by nutria which are not mm. native. Mm, yeah. And they one. pretty much destroy the the beaver colonies that aren't destroyed by men. And we do have beaver down here. I think someone knows some people along Cypress Creek. She's told me some people 
kill certain animals because they don't believe we have beaver down here. So they're killing beaver because they think it's a nutria. We don't have beaver down here. We couldn't possibly have beaver down here. So they kill it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <sighs> well, and of course we do. Of course we do. Some do. Speak for yourself, Terry. <laughs> 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 I know you don't. Of course. That's just rhetorical, of course. I know. But I know. Terry wouldn't do that. Okay, so folks, Terry wouldn't no. do that. Terry's cool. <laughs> Terry rocks the house. Okay. Well, this has been fun discussion today. And one thing, really quickly, if you got a few more minutes, um, yeah, for Chinese tallow, um, how that can affect things like the leaves will fall. They have a different chemical composition than the leaves that have typically been in the area, and they're more quick to decomposing. I think they decompose in one season as opposed to several for some other leaves, like some of the oak. Um, so they decompose quickly, change the chemistry of the soil, change the acidity of the soil. Um, what, don't the roots give off some exudates, which also change the chemical composition of the soil? Yeah. And that affects the yes, ability al- of other they, plants. The trees are allelopathic, which means they inhibit the growth of other species around them, both through those root uh, exudates and, um, as you say, leaf drop. But, um, and, and it goes back to what we were saying earlier, that all of those not native elements being put into the soil are, they're not able to, to be used in the same way as before because some of the decomposing community is gone. They can't use it. And what is what nutrients are released are not necessarily what the surrounding ecosystem needs. It's totally different uh, soil makeup now. Yeah. So, yeah, just like some people already know how certain plants need a certain soil pH. So affecting the pH will affect what trees can grow there or not, um, and the mineral composition too. Some trees need um, certain ratios of some minerals to grow well, certain minerals in the first place. Um, it's going to affect, just like um, kind of in general, if you look at closer to streams or ponds, um, you can have some... Um, river birch, some black willow, and you're not going to find those further up from the creek, but you will find um, some um, loblolly pine and so on. Um, There's differences like that because of the moisture level, pH, nutrient composition. changing all that then yeah we're not going to have our pine forests anymore um yeah. some of the oaks or some of the others um well you know there's there's another aspect uh it there's never one thing to look at mm-hmm. that can cause problems in an ecosystem there's never said, one thing the true is the whole yeah so you know some of what you're saying now uh, is circling back again to things like declines in especially insect species. Um, so think about this. One of the things that trees need to be able to to photosynthesize is nitro- nitrogen. Well, they use a lot of nitrogen in that process. And the, the higher the, the, they use it to break down the carbon in the atmosphere. So the higher the carbon dioxide, the higher the carbon in the atmosphere, the more nitrogen the trees have to use up to break down that carbon for photosynthesis. And that means the less nitrogen goes into things like leaves and flowers and pollen and you know, pollinators don't use pollen just to pollinate the flowers. That's a food source for them. 
and especially bees specifically target pollen as a food source because of the high nitrogen in it, which is their protein source. Bees use that as their protein source. So when trees are putting less nitrogen into their flowers, or plants using more nitrogen, putting less nitrogen into their flowers, when vegetation is having to use more and more of their nitrogen content to break down the carbon in the atmosphere, then it's less healthy food in the pollen and the nectar for pollinators. So it's not just loss of habitat. It's not just invasive species. There's, you know, how we manage, how we humans, quote, manage in our, for want of a better word, ignorance of what we're doing, um, affects the environment around us in so, so many ways. It's, it's, it's an endless litany of things we're, we we could do better, but we don't think about the the results because we don't put a dollar value on the services from the ecosystem. And there's and there's where you know humans place value on things is dollar amount. So we somehow we have to change that thing. I'll put a link to some stuff. Some people have started to do some of that, some scientists, since, as you say, that's what some people need. Um, what's the dollar value of this? They've looked at different ecological services, put a dollar value on it, seen how many billions or hundreds of billions some stuff is worth. So I'll see if I can find a link to that. And, um, um, link to check out the iTree. Uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head exactly, but it's iTree. And you can go in there and... Uh, put in where you are geographically. I think it's a zip code, but I'm not sure if I remember that right. You put in where you are geographically. You put in the kind of tree you have in your yard and a little bit of how big it is, how old it is, or whatever. And it will calculate for you the environment of that tree, how much oxygen it puts out, how much carbon dioxide it takes in, uh, how much uh, flood control it gives, uh, how much it contributes uh, nutrients into the soil, all, all manner of ecological benefits. It will calculate for you and tell you the value of that tree in your yard. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's interesting is without the ecosystems and the biology, we wouldn't have gems either. There you go. Because scientists have, have looked at how much oxygen has been in the environment and at one point there wasn't much, then life comes along, more oxygen in the environment, and we can have these oxygen mineral combinations, and bam, right there are a lot of the jewels that people value yeah. so much. Um, don't remember some so of the... We, oh, oh we, we value the services we get. We just don't put a dollar value on them so that we protect them. That's the problem. Yeah, and then some ignorance too. It's like you go to the grocery store and there's some food, you turn on the tap and there's your water. There's this for too many, just because of the culture. It's not because people are stupid. We're busy, don't have time. You got the education you did, but um, when we look at what's going on, we see there's um, a lot of that comes from the environment. There's a lot of stuff that's very important that, um, we get from nature, not from ourselves. Yeah. Um, then without some of the trees, like uh, another kind of cycle thing coming up, you know, we got um, without some certain trees, there's different birds um, who are control on some insects. Some insects might not be around anymore because they need certain trees. You got Chinese tallow instead. Then there's different birds. Um, there's all these evolutionary dances, ecological dances going on. And once one partner is gone, then the other partner doesn't have anybody to dance with. The whole dance falls apart. Um, you know, for 
get rid of some trees. We're going to get rid of some woodpeckers. Beautiful things to watch. Um, without some of the bigger trees dead or dying, some woodpeckers aren't going to have homes. Um, and it's interesting seeing some of the relationships. Like one thing you know, I'm sure, Terry, and um, kind of shows some of this relationship is how some woodpeckers pick tall pine trees and they'll make a hole up there for their den, their nest, but then they know to poke holes along the tree between the ground and their nest and they know that the sap will come out and that will help their protect the nest from some rat snakes who can climb great heights to get at some of the eggs and babies. Yes, the red cockaded woodpecker is the only woodpecker that makes its nest in live trees for that exact purpose. Their biggest predator is the Texas rat snake. And so those uh, those sap wells all encircling the, the hole, the entrance to the nest, is uh, sticky stuff. You know, the sap runs out, it's sticky stuff, and it, it pretty effectively prevents the snake from being able to to crawl up and get into their nest and eat the birds, eat the eggs. Mm-hmm. So there's all that kind of thing that would be affected. And then think about yeah. another example if for an invasive species is, okay, well, what happens when a human being gets an invasive species? We get some bacteria or virus in us. Um, sometimes we can fight it off, but as we see, it can cause great illness. Um, look through human history, all the different quote-unquote invasive species we can get in our body and how it affects us. Our body's like an ecosystem. Again, we're not some totally human thing divorced from everything else. Um, we're just this. We're a walking ecosystem. Bacteria, viruses, fungus, all over in us and on us, helping us survive and thrive. And we would not have the help that we do and the psychological well-being um, without them. Absolutely, yes. Um, there's even an interesting book about some of that. Um, forgot the author. She's a doctor, medical doctor, but uh, she wrote a book called Pharmacology. But usually, of course, pharmacology, pharmaceuticals, search with the pH, but to connect how the human animal works and how farms work, I think she saw a connection there. Um, similar kind of like a farm's a kind of ecosystem and, she, you know, she was learning how the human animal is an ecosystem, saw the relationships between the two, um, and so her, called her book Pharmacology with an F, F-A-R-M, F-A-R-M. Yeah. Yeah. Nice little play on words, nice title. Yeah. But, um, so this stuff matters. It's not an academic, irrelevant issue. Um, anything else you want to add, Terry? Um, or do you think we've all had... I, I think I think we've kind of talked through it, and I, I thought it was a great discussion, and I thank you for Sweet. allowing me to, to bring the topic up. Awesome. Thanks for discussing it and being on, and thank you for, yeah, um... Make it more white. Appreciate you know, it. More known about it and yeah, spread and help people do something about it and know why it matters. My pleasure, Michael. It's my pleasure always. Cool. Thank you, Terry. You're welcome. Appreciate your wisdom. So, all right. So, hope you enjoyed that, folks. Um, again, we'll have some contact information for Terry in the show notes if you're interested. Has some stuff in there that you can look at. Um, food for thought, start for research, um, stuff you can share with other people. Maybe there'll be something new in there for you that you can look up and learn about. But thank you uh, for listening and get out, enjoy, help make our environment and ecology better, let it function better. Um, 
make it healthier. We need it. Fresh water, oxygen, etc., etc. But go out there, be good human animals, and enjoy. Thanks again for listening.